relentlessly advancing through the frost hollow like some many-limbed, gibbering eldritch horror, casting an electronic screech onto every vox frequency that will take it. This is the unrelenting, skittering, and clawing thing of Rebellion, 665.66 UHMR Chemrat Radio. My misadventures tonight take me deep into the underhive's own past, into the forgotten warrens of the sump. All this in search of those shiny, shiny Archaeotech gubbins. My guide tonight is the infamous treasure hunter and rogue Archaeo savant Chalk. Tell me, my man, what exactly are we on the lookout for down here? We're looking for lost pieces of lore. It's been rumored, rumored only, that there's an STC down here that has all the beginnings and all the answers that we've been looking for. My, my main question, though, is more more plasma guns? That's, that's really... <laughs> Better than plasma guns. Double-barreled plasma guns. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Armed, as always, with what some might say is an unhealthy amount of plasma weaponry and the willingness to slag first and ask questions never, I am your host, Goblin King, and I am joined today by a partner in all things grave robbing, my guide to these twisting frozen tunnels of lost history, Chuck. Hey, guys. So welcome to episode 63 of Under the Hive of Madness. This is our first episode on our origins of 40K. We toyed around with the idea of how we wanted to structure this. And originally we talked about, do we do a limited series of, you know, 10 to 15 episodes? Do we make it its own thing like Loris Obscurus and Tales from the Hive? And then we kind of just came to the understanding that it fit best within the overall blanket of our numbered episodes. And that, that's why it's coming to you guys as episode 63. I know generally speaking, we would have done a Loris Obscurus episode this week, but this is a special occasion. Uh, quite a bit of the cast is at LVO and Chalk and I have been talking about this project for like six months. So it was time to start. Um, we'll definitely hit you guys with episode one today and then we will hit you with episode two in this series and probably about a month's time. And then we'll kind of play it by ear from there. But this is definitely a very, very big ball of yarn. And we are going to pluck at and pull as many of the threads out as we can. However, Chalk, before we jump into that, you and I might be the two members of our community that have been playing for the longest. I know that we've got another community member who has also been playing for quite some time. Um, but I actually believe he mentioned that he didn't start playing until the late 90s. So I think it's you and I who fall into the early 90s players. My earliest games fell into second edition with the Eldar. What was your earliest experience with 40K specifically? And, and not, not necessarily the 28 millimeter miniatures, but 40K as a, a genre. Well, that's a good question. So there's 40K as a genre, and then there's 40K the game. My first experience with 40K, the genre, was with Rogue Trader. Now, a lot of people call that first edition, but it really isn't. It's, it's really not, yeah. a different game. Um, second edition, 40K, which I also played, and I'm playing now, by the way, is, um, or at least I'm modeling it now, is really first edition 40K. Rogue Trader yes. was so yeah. different different i mean there weren't space marines there were things like space marines but there weren't space Spa marines space warriors there were space warriors <laughs> in power armor but you could play a navigator you could yep. play a um telepath what the astro telepathica whatever those guys are um it was it was sort of like in some ways sort of like kill team in that you could sort of have named characters and all, and they could advance. Um, and you, we didn't have enough people to actually have a game master, but you were supposed to play with a third person as a game master. Yeah. Um, yeah. we had somebody else would take over those duties. Um, you know, all the, you know, we they really talk about all the weird fauna and flora that you like that populate the Warhammer universe. Those all almost come from um, rogue trader and they were all actually played on the tabletop. You could be yeah. eaten by a damn land clam. I hated those damn things. 
Well, there there was uh, there was Luther McIntyre yes. like nine or whatever the planet was yeah. called, and I, and a lot of a lot of stuff uh, and and Catachan actually was mentioned yes. uh, in Rogue Trader, and a lot of a lot of that stuff as we as we go into our Planet Spotlight episodes, we've been having fun digging into that stuff. But yeah, as Chuck mentioned, Rogue Trader was a science fiction game, and it was the first officially released Games Workshop sci-fi game. Uh, as Games Workshop, um, and it was announced at Games Workshop's annual Games Day event in October of actually it wasn't you know that eighty seven oh it was not it was, the it, first released sci fi game oh that's right they did um, not confrontation um, well I actually think that um, Judge Dredd came before but Judge Dredd was licensed for two thousand A D. This is the first like standalone. And, oh, standalone, yeah. I mean, and, right. and so the, Rogue Trader was Warhammer Fantasy in space. Very yeah. specifically, it was it was it crossed over. You could play characters either way, and they they've you know you had magic. You could play magic in Rogue Trader. You could have yeah. Um, wizards could call Chaos Space Marines into the world of Warhammer oh, Fantasy, and you had like yeah. relic plasma guns and power armor that you could play with. Yeah, it, it was it was uh, it was a wild time. So so it's interesting that you brought up the the correction that you just did, and didn't mean to correct your correction. But the reason that Warhammer, the reason that Rogue Trader has the subtitle Warhammer Forty Thousand, was because of exactly this. Mm-hmm. Games Workshop, Citadel Miniatures under Games Workshop had produced role playing content and miniatures for 2000 AD for Judge Dread and one of the other things that was in 2000 AD was Rogue Trooper yes. which they had also made miniatures and game supplements mm-hmm. for and they didn't want people to confuse Rogue Trader for a Rogue, Rogue Trooper, Trooper yeah. release yeah it's it's it's, uh, it's interesting but yeah it was it was released in October of 1987 um it had been in development by Games Workshop though through the Citadel Journal up until about 1986 when they kind of decided to take everything consolidate it into one thing and release it uh right now um or or recently uh kind of in the ether there's a lot of talk about Challenge magazine that, that was released here in the United States and that's the magazine that has the sunstroke campaign in it which introduces I, I believe they're called the little sisters of battle or the little sisters of silence or something which is the female space marine chapter that actually was released in conjunction with the citadel journal articles so it actually kind of minutely predates the official release of rogue trader so just to give you guys an idea of of, of all the stuff that was in the ether and just how long ago all this was happening yeah. rogue trader was created by rick Priestley. The game featured rules, as Chalk just outlined, that were a little bit more around role-playing, but they were also kind of modeled on the fantasy counterpart of Warhammer Fantasy Battle. And you had mentioned that you could kind of push and pull things back and forth, right? You could could pull uh, uh, um, Chaos Warriors from fantasy into War into Rogue Trader and you vice versa. If you pull up the first page... First or second page of the actual text of the Rogue Trader book, they say it's interchangeable. They they flat yeah. out say, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it's, it, it's interchangeable. It used to be. Yeah, <laughs> and you did have element. I mean, so it, in Rogue Trader, Rogue Trader and Warhammer Fantasy Battle existed in the same universe. They don't right. anymore, and it's not completely clear when they separated. It was someplace around third edition. I feel like it was in third edition because I remember when I, you know, I I had played my first handful of games in second edition, but when I got really into it in third edition, um, you know, late late nineties, I had started having my own money. I wasn't, you know, playing with my two units of Eldar and mm-hmm. my friends' armies. Uh, it was still very much part that the Warhammer Fantasy Battle World was a planet that you could visit yes. in the forty k universe. That was still canon ish i guess yeah it was not, the really, ish. not really that canon's a word we should use but <laughs> it, it was i mean because they, they they said you could you know you could move back and forth in rogue trader um things were a lot looser than um there's a great orc supplement for rogue trader that's freebooters free buddhas oh yeah and I'm trying to get my hands on a bunch of that stuff right now. i've got i've got the uh i've got the pdfs of all of these and um that's where you get like Orc gene stealer hybrids, and you can yep. 
and they they tell you how to model them. So they specifically tell you how to add extra arms to them and all that. And they're all the pictures. They're whole rules for uh, uh, orc hybrids. And they're part of a specific freebooter um, uh, army. Yeah, it, it's it's pretty crazy. And that, that, that actually leads me into a couple of things that I wanted to point out still with Rogue Trader before we kind of moved on. A lot of the races that we are very familiar with nowadays uh, existed already. Oh, yeah. You know, squats who, yeah, who so are squats, recently back. Yeah, Eldar, um, yep. Tyranids, or at least Gene Steelers. Um, yeah, I think, I think the Tyranid expansion really yeah. happened in uh, second, second edition. edition. But yeah. they were there in Rogue Trader. Of course, you had orcs. Um, yep. As far as the the imperial factions, of course, you had uh, the imperial army. You had uh, armored imperial army, which was yep, basically space marines now, but they they just didn't exist um, in the same way. I mean, yeah, they did. You had the legions and everything because the history was there. Yeah, and, and some of the some of the basis of the genetic manipulation and everything was there, but when when the miniatures for it, so in the Citadel Journal era, yeah, um, as as Rogue Trader was kind of ramping up, they were Space Warrior, yeah. Space Warrior and Power Armor, um, and it was very it was very very unclear. I uh, left completely. I, I'm sorry, it wasn't unclear. Left completely unstated as to whether or not Space Marines were you know, pulled from certain areas or were the certain type of people or anything like that. Um, but a lot of the bones were there. Yeah. Uh, you d- you the, did the, have chapters. I, I yeah. like that. One of the first chapters was the rainbow warriors. Yeah. <laughs> um, the ultra me ultramarine successor chapter. So you even had successor chapters then. Um, and a lot of the heresy is already laid out at least in broad steps. Yes. You can find passages in rogue trader that talk about, the, the heresy, you know, the the emperor isn't necessarily the god emperor yet. Like a lot of the no. a lot of this stuff. And he's that's not necessarily hasn't happened yet. He's he's not like he's entombed on the golden throne either. He's severely wounded and he's on the golden throne, but not in the same way he is now. Yeah, but well, back in Rogue Trader, he was just a dude. Yeah, he wasn't this near mythical creature. He was just a guy. Yeah. And um, so a lot of the bones were there. The, the majority of the history is there. I mean, there you could see you could see space marines on on the the, the, the cover. cover right there. Um, even even fighting orcs. <laughs> yeah. And if you the, the pictures inside are just great. They've got these little dioramas and all. And this is what I was yeah, exposed it's such to. Such a beautiful book. Um, in the um, Patreon segment, which you guys should totally sign up for the Patreon. Um, we talked about shameless plug how. <laughs> In the U.S., a lot of us, our first exposure, my first exposure was through Dragon Magazine, was through ads in Dragon Magazine, where, you know, anybody could buy ad space, and it wasn't just D&D stuff. Um, so that's where I first saw these pictures, and, and where you could send away, and matter of fact, that's how I got my goddamn miniatures. There, there wasn't a Games Workshop store in California. Yeah. And and the the we'll touch on we'll touch on Citadel Miniatures and Games Workshops history as a company kind of towards the end as we wrap up episode one, but this will come back up and I'll come back up for a really important reason. Games Workshop Citadel Miniatures was one of the only companies that produced miniatures yeah. in the eight in in the late eighties. Well, yeah, in the eighties really because the company predates the release of Rogue Trader. Uh, and it, that's, it's important to remember. It's key to remember there, there's actually, um, we'd, we'll wait until we get there. We'll let it be a surprise. But I, before we move off of the rogue trader book completely, I wanted to mention two things near and dear to my heart, uh, that I hope we're getting little, little kernels of right now, but the Zotes and the space slant mm-hmm. and where did they go? I mean, I know the Zotes are kind of back, but where did my space land go? They man? just I want my space land back. They where are my frogmen? They weren't squatted <laughs> or anything. They just sort of disappeared. They just stopped. Well, they, yeah, the space land are. If you're familiar with Laura, you've been listening to the podcast. We've mentioned the old ones a lot. The space land and the old ones are very they're synonymous with one another. Uh, but they were playable in Rogue Faction. Rogue Faction. I'm sorry, Rogue Trader. 
and they were playable in second edition and they had models like you know some of these old citadel ads if you can find them there is space slant on it with rifles <laughs> frogmen mm-hmm. with rifles they weren't just an age of sigmar army back in the like they are now and and we're in uh, warhammer fantasy battle yeah and you know they just sort of they stopped writing for them. And it wasn't like the squats, at least the squats, they had a two line throwaway, how the Tyranids ate them all. They didn't even, they didn't have that for the slot. They just like stopped. Oh, they just stopped. And yeah. then all of a sudden the Zotes came back as a client race for the Tyranids. Right. And, 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 you know, obviously there's all sorts of lore tidbits about the old ones and the war in heaven and all that. So they, they, they hint at it. Um, and it, it it's it's very classic. We talked about this as well earlier uh, in our in our Patreon segment. GW has always had this kind of method towards approaching their world building, where one they're very very upfront that everything that the Imperium records and shares is propaganda, lies, misinformation, half truths, and guesswork. And the second thing they do is they're the masters of the one liner. Games Workshop will release an entire codex. It'll be the Tyranid 5th edition codex, let's just say. And like on page 93, at the very, very bottom, it will say, and then the HRUD attacked the yes. Chaos Space Marine Marauders. And that's it. That They won't talk about it. And then all of a sudden, a week and a half ago, Rumor Engine will release an image that James Games Workshop will refer to as possibly being a HUD, and everyone will lose their minds. <laughs> like they leave these kernels so they can come back to them whenever they. I want don't know to. if they leave them or if they just toss off one liners and somebody or goes. If they forget it. <laughs> hey, remember because they they need something. I mean, you look at if you go through a compendium of minor races, they're all these things oh that God, don't have everywhere. a description. They just have like a one liner with a name. <laughs> my favorite are the like the star fiends of classic clack five yeah. and you're like oh that sounds interesting and it's like the star fiends were encountered in classic clack five you're like thanks yeah that's it <laughs> i mean you know going back to the slan we all know what the slan look like we all know what the old ones look like but yeah, in they're, they're current gw lore 40k lore do they describe them is it actually no, descri- no it's not we all know the reptilian toad like thingies well, I take I take that back. There is a description somewhere of the slan looking like the the great slan on the hovering throne. Yeah, the, the one that's in the age of um, age of Sigmar, the Seraphon line. Mm-hmm. There is a description of that being what the great slan look like. But as far or what the the old ones look like. Yeah. But as far as what the the old ones warriors look like, there is no description. Uh, it, and it's interesting because, like, again, the models exist. You know, if if you're if you're on our Patreon or you want to get on our Patreon, I got an image pulled up right now. If you're just listening and you're like, "This sounds super interesting," what are these two guys talking about? Yeah, go type in "slan" into Google, and you will get space or space land into Google, and you will get images of frogs with laser rifles. Yeah, they're, they're basically that's what they look like. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it, this is. They're basically uh, fantasy battle models with yeah. rifles. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, uh, it's pretty funny. So the other big thing that we have to talk about really quickly is that the Rogue Trader book doesn't talk about chaos the way we talk about it yet. They do mention the warp, yeah. but information is very limited and the idea of chaos doesn't show up yet. And that kind of brings us into what, this series is really about talking about the origins of of 40k to get into that the tone of rogue trader is in line with a lot of the more whimsical and satirical styles that were very prevalent during the 70s and 80s and continued into the early 90s while i believe we're still supposed to carry a lot of this forward as our mental picture of what a lot of the modern lore it can be very jarring you know a lot of the stuff in early 40k was very much an in joke you know Mm -hmm. orcs were a joke and when you look at joke when you look at orcs now they're a threat so there's this kind of weird jarring comparison and i i I believe a lot of that is because a lot of the information is now presented as humanity as the imperium sees it in the universe as to where back then it was very tongue-in-cheek we're playing a game the opening text too, that opening text crawl that we're all very familiar with that has existed 
almost in its entirety with only minor tweaks from the early, early, early stages of you know, post Rogue Trader and early Black Library publications. So we're talking in the couple of splats that came out in Rogue Trader that you know the galaxy has been at war for ten thousand years. You know, o- open the the newest rule book that you have. That crawl on page one has existed from the very for beginning, a long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rick Priestley cites J.R.R. Tolkien, H.P. Lovecraft, Dune, Paradise Lost, and A- and 2000 A.D. as major influences on the setting that he wrote when he wrote Rogue Trader. The Chaos Gods were added to the setting by Brian Anzell and developed further by Priestley. While the earliest versions were very simple and felt way too much like direct copies of the works of Michael Moorcock, Priestley developed them further, taking inspiration from Paradise Lost and obviously H.P. Lovecraft. The story of the Emperor's favored son succumbing to temptations of chaos and deliberately, very much deliberately parallels the fall of Satan in Paradise Lost. If you guys are unfamiliar, Paradise Lost is an epic poem by uh, Milton. Milton. What's his first name? Uh, by Milton yeah. Paradise Lost <laughs> by Milton will get you to what we're talking about uh, it's a very very famous epic poem and it honestly kind of sets a lot of what people believe as the story of the Bible even though it none of it's in the Bible <laughs> uh, it's very interesting it's a very very interesting piece of uh, literary fiction I definitely recommend it to anybody interested in this sort of stuff the religious themes are primarily inspired by the early history of Christianity itself and demons of the Warhammer 40 K universe are the embodiment of human nightmares, dark emotions given physical form and sentience by the warp. This idea actually comes from the 1956 movie forbidden planet. So a lot of different influences just in the first couple of reiterations or expansions of the original idea. The, Emperor of Man was inspired by various fictional god kings, Leto Atreides II from the novel God Emperor of Dune by Frank Herbert, King Hunan from Rune Staff novels by Michael Moorcock. Again, Michael Moorcock has come up. While the emperor's suffering on the golden throne for the sake of humanity is meant to mirror the sacrifice of the biblical fu- figure of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ martyred himself on the cross. The emperor martyred himself on the golden throne. Humans fear artificial intelligence and creating or protecting artificial intelligence is a capital offense. This is a direct reference to the Dune novels. And the Eldar Webway was actually inspired by the Underdark from Dungeons and Dragons. Dark elves, the drow, live underground and travel the world through a network of tunnels with openings to the surface here and there, which they can use to raid above ground communities. Their cities, like the city of Menzabrinzin, is built into the largest of these caverns, much like the Dark Eldar's home of Cremora lies scattered throughout various paths deep in the tunnels of the webway. So it's this mixing pot of a bunch of ideas that came out of that time in fiction. You know, these books, these stories are coming out, these science fiction books are coming out, this stuff is all being talked about as rogue trader develops into warhammer 40k you know i didn't um i did not realize the connection with um where was it up here now (laughs) i lost it i just gave like 20 i know i know now i lost it there's something that that i really did not catch um and now i can't now i don't know which what it is um, the the one that caught me off guard when I was starting to do this research was that the Eldar Webway is based on the Underdark. Like as soon as I read it, oh, it makes I was complete like, sense. Oh fucking course! But like before I read it, I never would have thought. I never would have made that link. Oh, and of uh, course, the, you know the Drow are intimately yeah. connected with spiders, so the Webway makes perfect sense. The Eldar are not. The Dark Eldar. Are not, and so why is yeah. it a webway? Well, because it's it's a web that's spun through the uh, through the warp, right? Well, and, the- and elves elves are Eldar. Yeah, if you and and Kevin has made this point in past episodes. You know, elves are Eldar, and dark Eldar are dark elves. So, like, 
everything in 40K has a fantasy analog. And, and, and again, it makes perfect sense. Rick Priestley lists Tolkien as his first inspiration. Well, if, you, if you go back, I mean, if you look at the interviews from the time, they specifically say we were sort of tapped out on the models that we're making for fantasy, um, for, uh, yeah. fantasy settings. Um, so Warhammer fantasy evolved into Warhammer fantasy battles because fantasy battles had a lot more miniatures. So you had to buy a lot yeah, more miniatures. Exactly. Yeah. So it moved into fantasy battles so they could produce more miniatures for you to buy, but they're like, we don't have anything in the science, in a science fiction universe. So what we're going to do and they're very clear about this, is to sell more models, to do a more new model line. They did Warhammer Fantasy in space. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, you've got stuff that's ready to package. And then, you know, you take time, especially with the writing style, that they're really, that you know, the original authors, the original guys are really, really open about. We just changed it. Yeah. That, that was the whole point. We'll start off with something very foundational that we can just change over time. And, you know, the the the... And we've talked about this when it comes to writing speculative fiction in the 40K universe. The 40K universe is the entire galaxy of possibilities. Pick an off the beaten track thing and write what yeah. you want. You know, <laughs> for, uh, 40K, you have knights in space, elves in space, orcs in space, dragons in space, which really turn out to be the Tyranids. Um, well, no, they're this, they're these big, like horror, not oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> um, you had dwarves in space that didn't work out. So the dragons in space ate the dwarves. <laughs> and now we have, now them we have them again. <laughs> um, so it, it, it was very clear. Now they didn't, they didn't bring everything over. Of course they didn't bring Skaven over. They brought Slan over and then stopped producing for them. They almost brought yeah. Skaven over. So so very, very interesting. Jess Goodwin, who is the is a concept artist, and and I might be wrong on this. This is not the Tao episode, so you know, you know, take take this with a grain of salt. But guess Jess Goodwin was the concept artist. I know that for a fact. Um, had been working on Space Skaven for a while. Space Skaven stopped being in the books in two thousand five when the side supplement zeniology came out um which is this is you know, 2005 would be like fourth edition i believe um if i'm getting my timeline correct and in that case that is the first time that space gaven stopped being referred to and they started referring to the hrud and the hrud stopped looking like space gaven in, in sketches but if my memory serves me correctly jess goodwin was also involved in porting space gaven to fourth edition 40k that became the Tau. I've not heard that story. That's exactly that, that's what happened. They were working on Space Skaven, and you know, one, two, three led to four, five, six, and we got the Tau. And you know, it, it as it, as the interview goes, as as they're talking, and I'll pull up the direct quotes when we hit the Tau as a as a faction series. Or actually, you know what? We'll talk about it in this series because I think it, it's it's more nascent mm -hmm. here. Um, but we'll talk about it in the future. I'll, I'll have my facts in order. But basically, during the interview process, during this interview process about the creation of the Tau, he mentions, you know, the Tau started off as a space gaven, but as I worked on it more and more, it just made sense that they were this other race. And we could put the space gaven back on the shelf for a future date. And and maybe that's starting to happen. There are rumors. Yeah. There are tickles. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, you, like you said, they're, they're, you know, beasts of chaos came over for a little mm -hmm. bit. They, they still technically exist lore wise, but there's no model line no. for them. You can't really do beast um, men. I mean, you, you, you can fold them into, if you want to kit bash them and fold them into your, um, guard army, but the rules don't really exist in ninth. Yeah. Beast. Beast men in an Imperial Guard army, it, to be the spirit of beast men from fantasy, they would have to be tougher and they'd have to be better at close combat than guardsmen yeah. are. However, from a lore perspective, there are planets that have beast men and there are beast men who have fought for the Imperium. By and large, the Imperium exterminates them because they're more predisposed to chaos, which is just Imperium mm -hmm. speak for we don't like the way they look. But at the end of the day, there's nothing that says if you didn't want to get bash yeah. 
beast men into an army. There's could... there's a whole planet of cat girls and cat boys. <laughs> That's right. And that <laughs> that that is lore. <laughs> okay, there's there's some interesting things in lore. <laughs> I can't even make fun of that too much because I I I haven't really talked about this is probably the series to bring it up, but I've been writing a fantasy world for about 30 years. Um, and I'm kind of in the end stages of figuring out how to release it a little bit more widely. It, it was on a wiki that was open to the public for a long time. And I just don't like the way that wiki works um, anymore. So I'm porting it over to world anvil, but I have two cat races. I have a feral cat race and I have, well, I have a cat race that is split kind of into two. There are the, like feral cats, uh, feral men, ca cat people, and then there are the domesticated cat people. Um, and it, it just, it didn't come out of, I mean, I literally wrote them into the lore of the world like 20 years ago, and it literally came from, uh, I, I used to play Vampire the Masquerade, and Vampire the Masquerade has the Bastet, mm -hmm. and the Bastet are werewolves that turn into cats. And that's where it came from. It came from that and um, the Kazinti from uh, Niven. Larry Niven's yeah, world. Where, where like my cat people are the type that rip your arms off when they lose at chess. They are not uwu uh, cat people. That's because you're no culture fun. Culture has changed. <laughs> 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 well, well so, so technically the Lathani, which are the domesticated um, cat people, if you want, you know, it, it's they're the newer offshoot they are they're the they're the cat people who moved into like like human cities essentially and they're they're not very old they're a very young race uh because they're they're connected to this old race but they're a very young race and they're 100 percent the if you want to play an uwu play a lathon like that's the way they're they're kind of written as as fan service cat girls i'm trying to fix that because that was uh, i used to have a couple of co-writers and that was something that a co-writer had introduced um and and i had two options at this point i can go back and retcon thousands of pages of shit that I've written to remove this race, or I can just fix the race. So I'm just fixing the race. Um, but it sounds a lot like it was Games kind of Workshop. funny because, because there's literally, there's literally a, um, I, I have a lot of the original notes that were written and there's literally a uh, bar napkin note from like the early two thousands where uh cat girls, like Final Fantasy is written down <laughs> and then the name is scribbled under it. So I know where the concept came from. But yeah. Um anyway, that that's uh maybe maybe as this develops further uh I'll I'll figure out how to segue into talking about my own fantasy world. But um to get us back, I have a quote from Rick Priestley that I'd like to introduce. To me, the background to 40K was always intended to be ironic. The fact that the Space Marines were lauded as heroes within Games Workshop always amuses me because they're brutal, but they're also completely self-deceiving. The whole idea of the Emperor is that you don't know whether he's alive or dead. The whole Imperium might be running on a superstition. There's no guarantee that the Emperor is anything other than a corpse with a residual mental ability to direct spacecraft. It's got some parallels with religious beliefs and principles, and I think a lot of that got missed and has been overwritten. So that was Rick Priestley in December 2015 with an interview he did with Unplugged Games. As we mentioned up top with this series, we aim to look at some of the obvious and maybe not so obvious roots of Warhammer 40k lore, exploring and introducing the speculative fiction that made up the foundation of the modern genre and influenced Warhammer 40k. Very, very much the grimdark setting and Warhammer 40k has become a genre into itself, which came out of the meat and potatoes of speculative fiction, mm -hmm. which can be looked at as a primer for writing lore that you want to make for your own 40k stuff. Or maybe you just follow along because we talk about speculative fiction and you're developing your own science fiction worlds. While we will look at all of Priestley's stated influences and probably spend an entire episode or two on Dune alone... I would like to start off with a series that I believe massively paved the way for any speculative fiction universe that includes anything approaching a galactic empire, Isaac's Asimov's Foundation series. And I also think if you're talking about um, influences on 40K, this is probably the least obvious. Oh yeah, 100%. And the reason that I 
I mentioned anything including a galactic empire is Isaac Asimov in 1951, I think is when the first book came. I, well, I think 1945, they were released as short yeah. stories. 1951, they were made into a and like book. Like Amazing Magazine. This is the, yeah, this is the first time any space opera had put down the concept of a galactic empire existing. To give you guys a little bit of foundation into the foundation, if you're interested in finding these books and reading along, prequel to the foundation is split into a couple of different books. The Prelude to Foundation was released in 1988. This was within six months of the release of Rogue Trader. The Forward of Foundation, Forward the Foundation, excuse me, was written in 1993. The original series, Foundation, was released in 1951. Foundation and Empire was released in 1952. And Second Foundation was released in 1953. The Expanded Foundation series, which is Foundation's Edge, was released in 1982 and was actually the first book in the Foundation series I read. And then Foundation and Earth was released in 1986. My first argument revolves around the planet of Trantor, the center of the galactic government. This is home to at least 45 billion people, all whom live under the domes or in massive spire cities that cover the surface of the entire planet. Population habitats run deep underground as far as they run above ground. The planet is split into 800 administrative sectors to govern the existing empire. Trantor is about 40% smaller than Earth, the planet is considered to be an enconopolis, a Greek conjunction meaning world city. Most of the world's population never sees the sun, instead relying on artificial sun rooms, sun rooms to get the much-needed vitamin D, D nutrients. Based on the importance of the empire, it is the most densely populated and industrial advanced planet that exists. 20 nearby agricultural worlds exist just to provide the population of Trantar with the food needed to provide for its people. With fleets of tens of thousands of spacecraft existing just to transport that food. A number of vessels that far outnumber the existing Imperial Navy of the Empire in the Foundation series. <laughs> the major beats of the first Foundation book center around the coming collapse of the Galactic Empire and a mathematically predicted 30,000 years of barbarism and war that will follow. So in everything I just said, we have a city planet, the population, and this is something that Asimov actually um, addressed later on in his career. The population of Trantor when he wrote the original books was optimistically low. I couldn't find the exact quote, but I remember reading it in college. He had later at one point had mentioned that the the reality is probably one or two of the spires on Trantor could probably house 40,000 or 45 billion people so that he greatly underestimated. I, I think the final figure he gave was like, like 32 trillion or something. If he were to rewrite it, it was 32 trillion. So... That's an interesting kind of like by product. But again, you know, it's a it's a world city, you know, just like Earth, uh, just like Terra, excuse me, in 40K. It's fed. It only exists because of 20 nearby agricultural worlds. And there's a fleet of vessels that only exists to transport food to the capital. And that is 100% Terra from the Warhammer 40K universe. Like, I... That's just how it is. Agri worlds are super important to 40K. Like this is whether or not the idea directly came from here or whether or not it's just one of those things that you come to. It It's interesting. It's an interesting parallel to me. I actually see it as um, an example of the world that existed before the Age of Strife. Yes. Yes. 100%. The Trantor... I, I like that. And I think as we, we keep going... It, it into, is still... Trantor yeah. is still in more or less its utopian phase. Yes. Um, and that's what Terra would have been, and that's what the Galactic Empire was before the Age of Strife. So this is... Right. Um, before the Unification Wars, this is before... This is actually what is happening, is the 30,000 years of predicted barbarianism, barbarism, 
barbarism, right? Would have been the Age of Strife, essentially. Would have been basically the Age of Strife and the techno-barbarians on Terra and everything that happened. And 40K, with when the Emperor comes out of the shadows and starts guiding the Emperor Empire back towards, you know, he conquers Terra and then starts the Unification Wars. This is the end of that cycle of barbarism. We are still in basically a failed state. Right. Um, it has not come back to the heights of what it was, but it is trying to claw its way out of darkness. Um, and of course, that's the theme of 40K. So this is more or less, for me, the Foundation series is about um, the time, you know, the golden age of technology. Very much so. It's it's interesting because I, as I go through some of the other examples, it very much supports your hypothesis, which is which is I, I love it. So to quote from the first book, at the beginning of the thirteenth millennium, the tendency this tendency had reached its climax as the center of the imperial government for unbroken hundreds of generations, and located as it was toward the central region of the galaxy, among the most densely populated and industrial advanced worlds of the system. It could scarcely help being the densest and richest clot of humanity the race had ever seen. And this is, again, a spot-on description of Terra, you know, in this golden age, essentially. Interestingly, if you take the 13th century and add 30,000 years of barbarism, you get to the 43rd millennia, which happens to be where current 40K is, more or less. Yeah, the the thing the thing that throws it. Did I say if I said thirteenth century? Sorry, it's thirteenth. Thirteenth millennia is what I meant. That, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, you're right because it, it's the forty forty second forty yeah. third. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. That is completely has nothing to do with one thing or the other. It's just <laughs> it's just yeah. interesting. Yeah. the The other thing that's interesting is that the population at its height, which was in excess of forty billions. It, of this enormous population, most of it was devoted entirely to the administrative necessities of the empire and found themselves all too few for the completion of this task. That's the administratum yeah. right there. I mean, the administratum is billions and billions and billions of people just trying to process data. So much like the parallels that we've already drawn to 40K, you can draw a lot of these parallels back to the collapse of the Roman Empire in our own history. The path of the Empire's full destruction wasn't clean, complete, or neat. While the idea of the Galactic Empire dissolved first, the remains are pushed ever inward until Tantor itself becomes the focus of several different warring factions. These barbarian kingdoms, as they're called, even completely destroy the metaphorical center of the Empire when they reduce Trantor to a ruined post-apocalyptic city. A city, planet, that becomes inhabited by the Hamish people. The Hamish people, who are subsidence farmers and are largely considered to be techno-barbarians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and again, this is stuff that was written in 1950. <laughs> this is not Asimov going, oh, this 40K guys have some good ideas and ripping them off. This is just another science fiction author kind of coming up with little roots. Sorry, go ahead. No, what, what I was saying is it, it, it's... You can almost see the foundation, the early parts of foundation as being the fall from grace. Of course, once again, we are talking right. about paradise lost. But what it is, is yeah. it's the collapse at the end of the golden age and where everything basically falls apart. And you end up with barbarians all over the, the galaxy, but especially on Terra. Right. And then you see the claw back and... You know, when we think about the history of 40K, a lot of this stuff is, it's pretty much glossed over because it's not part of the current game system. The current game system right. really starts with the Horus Heresy and all that. And of course, that's the big, that has been a big part of the history ever since um, Rogue Trader and definitely ever since um, Second Edition. But really, this is the, this is where civilization is coming back. The the yeah. actual, even though we see the Horus Heresy and the Civil War as being this huge defining moment in history, it's not. As far as cataclysms go, 
this is a bump in the road. I mean, right, it does right. not compare to what happened during the Age of Strife and when the Great Rift uh, opened up and the uh, the fourth right. Chaos God was birthed. That took yeah. civilization across the galaxy, which had reached its was height, destroyed, yeah. and, th- and threw it yeah. down. And that, it, and it's it's interesting because you know as you had just mentioned you know the, the traitor marine legions when they come to Terra they they do the siege of Terra which is a analog to the barbarians at the gates in Rome and is an analog to these barbarian warlords coming to Transhor you know they are a disorganized internally warfaring uh, internally warring organization the traitor marines are only loosely confederated or under Horus. They have vastly different personal agendas and infight all the time. So while they might be unified in the concept of this bump in the road, this destruction, they are nowhere near any sort of unity themselves. And as you had just mentioned, this is like, you know, the unification wars is the birth of the second empire and, and, the, and the regaining of the golden age what is the last 10,000 years of the Imperium other than the slow decline of the Roman Empire into the Holy Roman Empire and all the stuff that happened? And that, and it's important to note that like we're talking about Rome falling and we're talking about the Imperium of Man falling and all of that. But just like I mentioned with the Holy Roman Empire, the Roman Empire stopped to be at its height, but it didn't go away for a long time. And that's something that we see echoed in Warhammer 40k with the realm of Ultramar being seen in a lot of ways as a second Imperium. And and now with the coming of the Cicatrix Maledictum in current lore with the Dark Imperium and the Imperium itself, we get those same tones of this kind of like fall of Rome happening. Yeah, I don't know if, if the fall of Rome and the barbarians at the gates really shows the, the the chaos space Marines, uh, against the empire or if Rome was what fell leading into the age of strife. And what you had was the empire right now is someplace in the 13th or 14th century clawing their way out of, um, the barren the, vassal. Yes. States, and and still living in the ruins of the Roman empire, quite literally. Right. As oh, an yeah. archeologist, oh, yeah. I can tell you quite literally, you can, when something in like the eighth and ninth century in England talking about living in the the ruins of Londinium and sending and the the Saxon kings sending their sons to Rome and you have this very small sort of like papal enclave living within a ruined city. Oh, yeah. So what you have is you have sort of like these states that are coming together into bigger empires, but then you still have the barbarians beating at the gates so i i think yeah all around yeah i think a a better analog would be that we are in some place around the first the first millennium sometime around 1000 a.d is equivalent to where the 40k 41st is now yeah, so the the fall the fall of rome being the the end of the horus heresy no the fall of rome being the being the, the at the age of strife, yeah, being the start of the age okay. of strife, where you had okay, it, okay, okay. where you had this great civilization fall apart, but you still had places that sort of stood out. You had individual planets that were still okay, small pocket gotcha. empires that were still okay. Look at um, some of the human civilizations that sort of hung on. What was the one where they uh, the, the Horus Heresy, where he got the the magic knife that allowed him to. You know, oh, the the Im- Imitrek. Yeah, no, um, uh, yeah. The Im- you're not talking about the Imitrek. Well, yeah, it was the, the Imitrek. They steal the knife yeah, from the yeah, Imitrek, yeah. right? So you you still yeah. had these sort of like little pocket empires or little like pieces of civilization, but mostly it was dead. The unification yeah. wars can be sort of seen as a, uh, compared to, in my view, compared to the unification that was going on. In Europe, where you had the rise of the Holy Roman Empire, you had, um, you know, the Normans going along, but you still had the Vikings beating at the gates. Right, right, right. I got you. Yeah. So I, I just sense. moved the timeline forward because I, 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 like I see it. because I don't see the 40K universe as being 
the time of like the dark ages where everything has fallen apart. I see it being climbing its way out, looking right. back on the glory that was Rome. Right. And, and, and that makes sense because the ultramarines are very much styled after a Roman legion, mm-hmm. not to mention the 20 space marine legions, obviously being linked to like these Roman, they're looking back to the past when they come up with these ideas. Uh, I did say 20 Space Marine Legions. There were 20 of them. Two were written out of history. They still were 20, though, at one point. <laughs> there, and of course, you know that there were a couple of lost legions in from Rome. Right, exactly. There's that the, nobody knows what happened to fa- them. Famously, the Ninth Legion. Yes. Yeah. So uh, to get to get back to another one of my little, like, the foundation colonels. Harry Selden is seen as a traitor in quotes by the ruling population and the emperor because his mathematical predictions of this coming apocalypse. So he starts talking about, you know, we need to look at what's going to happen. We need to make some changes. We need to set a plan into motion. And everyone's like, uh, absolutely not here. Here you're, you know, you're uh, you're a malcontent. You're a traitor. However, even through this, Selden is doing it. Harry Selden, the, the guy who forms the foundation, is doing it to manipulate the community of public safety into granting him exile, which leads him to creating the foundation. And he does this through the establishment, the establishment of psychohistory. With psychohistory, the Dark Age and the birth of Second Empire will be possible. So psychohistory is a fictional science of applied use of history, sociology, and mathematical statistics used to make general predictions about the behavior of large groups of people. This is something that we see echoed in the tech priests of Mars and 40K, who often use complex analytical engines and devices and, um, what's it called, Uh, rituals to come up with predictions about future events this is the idea you know it's not called psychohistory but the idea of psychohistory is in the mechanicum (laughs) it really is yeah uh so he uses this psychohistory to predict the fall of the empire and you know says the empire is going to fall there's going to be a dark age of thirty thousand years swallowing the empire but if you help me i can reduce that dark age to a thousand years and with the permission of the emperor he forms the foundation, which is located on the planet Terminus, which is nice and as far away from the Empire as possible. It is a bleak world on the far eastern fringe of the galaxy. And it's here that they begin work on an Encyclopedia Galactica, which will be the record of history of the Empire and the expansion of all human knowledge. This is incredibly similar to the idea of the remembrancers of the heresy and the reinstatement of a different order of remembrancers by Dorne during the actual Siege of Terra. So if, you've re- if you're if you familiar at all with Warhammer 40K, I'm sorry, if you're familiar at all with Horus Heresy lore, there was a movement uh, by the Emperor of Remembrancers, and Remembrancers were sent along to chronicle the expansion of the Great Crusade. You know, let's celebrate all of human history. Let's celebrate the, the foundation of empire. We need boots on the ground. We need to record it. And because of that, in, in air, very, very big air quotes, the remembrancer orders allowed a breakdown in uh, discipline that led to Horus falling from falling to chaos, which is a, a, a vast oversimplification by the M- Imperium <laughs> about what the Remembrancers actually had to do with that event. But for whatever reason, that's how it's phrased. And it takes Dorne during the actual siege to go, oh shit, I need to bring these Remembrancers back. We need to do the exact same thing, but we don't need to do it for the public. We need to do it so we can leave a lasting message to whoever is going to survive. And part of the remembrance or order that Dorne forms is also tasked with rooting out these like dark beginnings of heresy that don't come from Horus. You know, ask these hard questions, find these hard answers that people are talking about saints. Saints don't make any sense. Go figure out what the fuck a saint is. If it's if it's a demon, we need to kill it. I need to know. And Dorne puts all this stuff into and you know, it's a very abstract link, but I can see the Encyclopedia Galactica and the actions of Dorne and the Remembrancers being very parallel thinking. 
It's also later revealed, again, to kind of parallel and give a little bit more evidence, that Selden established the encyclopedia completely as a cover. (laughs) What he was really trying to do with the creation of the foundation was plant the seed for the growth of the Second Empire. And again, this kind of parallels Dorn's actions. Dorn isn't trying to create a lasting history because he wants people to remember his name. Dorn is trying to create something that he knows will be capable of restarting if they lose. If we lose, these people will have enough knowledge that this can become the foundation of something better. Uh, Later on, four warring kingdoms attack the foundation, and they are manipulated by somebody else through the use of religion to turn against their own (laughs) empire, which causes a civil war and avoids manipulating religion core tactic of the imperium uh and the last book in the foundation is called the merchant princes which weaves the second empire's influence this the growing second empire's influence throughout all of the known planets and this is actually essentially what the emperor did with rogue traders right after the unification wars rogue traders were Go out, be merchant princes, spread our our way to the people that we don't know yet. Bring bring me back technology I don't know about, but go out and find these these different kernels, as, as Chalk was saying, these different pockets of what's left of the last empire. Find these different pockets and start influencing them to come back into the empire. That was the rogue trader's actual original purpose. You know, it, in the forty second millennium, everything's changed, but that was the purpose of rogue traders. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely um, parallels and analogs uh, to be seen there. I I really feel that, now I might differ with you on this, but I really feel that the Foundation series was more of an influence. And while there are elements that you can see parallels with, I don't know if it was drawn directly. I think it was more of a, this is sort of a setting or a feeling. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's not as direct, and and we'll get into it when we talk about the well, Dune series. Well, there's two, things from Dune that are almost directly oh, reflected yes. in forty. Well, and same with uh, two thousand A.D. Same right. with uh, Starship Troopers. Um, you know, there there was a lot of a lot of these other books that we'll be talking about later right. ha- have direct pulls. In some cases, whole ports. Through licensing, yeah. um, the, the, but the foundation yeah. series was much more of a. It's conceptual. It's a conceptual. You know? I, I think. Yeah. I think he's taking that. It's, it's building the. The the fall and rise, mm-hmm. trope mm-hmm. or, theme that is prevalent through a lot of stuff. I mean, you know, it's also there in Lord of the Rings. You right. had in right. the second age, you know, you had these different ages of man, and there was a fall into the third uh, during the third age, and um, you know, and the elves eventually, you know, get up and cross the sea to the shining land and all that because we don't like to think about it because people uh, tend to um, I don't want to say idolize, but uh, put the whole Lord of the Rings setting on a uh, sort of a pedestal, but it's really a post-apocalyptic it, it, setting. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, I, this is, it's really interesting because being somebody who's working on a fantasy setting, as I mentioned earlier, um, I'm going through a major map revision right now. And a very, very long story short, my original map was basically um, a, a, a tweak on middle earth. Um, and, a lot of people who make fantasy settings start with Middle Earth. Middle Earth is the standard. Yeah. It is the standard template you start with. Um, and I and I you know I realized before I was out of high school, uh, before I was in into college, that I needed to start changing that, and I had started changing it then. But it's just interesting that you yeah it, it, it's there's a pretty big feel in the fiction, the speculative fiction fantasy side that a, a lot of. Uh, golden standard stuff comes from Tolkien. Yeah. Um, to to go along with you, you know, the, the takeaway of the foundation when it comes to this is really the concept of massive centers of administration. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and a lot of how the empire is centralized in leadership. The difference, however, is that the Imperium 
as to where it's centralized into a figurehead and it's centralized under a religious figurehead, it is largely fragmented and decentralized. It's not really something that we address a lot in lore, but it's really fear of the Inquisition and the space marines that balance the distant systems into following any semblance that, recom- that comes close to the Imperial truth and the Imperial creed. As to where in the Foundation series, there's kind of this entire concept that violence never really solves anything. The reality of the grim dark of 40K is that violence and fear are the only thing that solve any problems and they're the only thing that keeps the empire, the Imperium together. Yeah. And those those are the, the, you know, as much as I can see parallels and as much as I can look at it, that's really the big thing. And I think the bigger takeaway is really, you know, we wouldn't have Coruscant and Star Wars. We wouldn't have Terra and 40K. We wouldn't have... Uh, you know, any of these, and, and I, I, they're escaping me for right now, but th- these, those are the two really big ones that we talk about in the United States, in, in American popular culture, American popular science fiction culture a lot. Um, I, I take that back. The Federation and Star Trek, we wouldn't have any of these galactic civilizations without Asimov having put no. down the, the whole idea. No, um, they, uh, But that could be it. That could be all that, that translates. <laughs> No, he, the, he, the, the Foundation series really does talk about a um, a galactic empire, a galactic government. Um, and, you know, that's the real fact. I mean, the galaxy is a big place. You know, you don't, you don't think about an empire that could control or need to control an entire galaxy. But you have that in 40K, and of course you... You have that in the Foundation uh, series. And then later on, of course, you have it's it in Star, Star Trek. Star Wars. Yeah. Actually, I'm not sure you have it in Star Trek. I don't think you do. The Fed- the Federation is big, but the Federation is not. You know, the, the Federation is a galactic empire. The Federation is not a galactic yeah. empire. Or the galactic. It it, it's, cl- a, it's, it's a it's a very small g yeah. galactic empire, not because the yeah. capital G. <laughs> yeah. there, there are really, in 40K, there are no really other competing empires. No, not anymore. Not anymore. I, you know, yeah. The Eldar are gone. That, that would have been the only thing. Um, and that's the same thing with Star Wars. Star Wars is a galactic empire in, with the big G. Yeah. There is no other but, civilization yeah. out but there. But a short, but a very short-lived one. The galactic empire in the Star Wars universe yes. um, b- burns very brightly for very short periods of time and then completely collapses and then burns really brightly and then collapses. It's very, the Star Wars, getting into deeper Star Wars lore would be a thing that I would want to do if I thought I had any time. <laughs> so Listen to um, Eckerd's you, Ladder. Okay, okay. <laughs> so you had said something that, that made me think of one of my favorite quotes about space. And this is by Douglas Adams. Space is big. You won't just believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down the road to the chemists, but that's just peanuts to space. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's you know, we, we, we covered Foundation. Let's jump into 2000 AD, that's which has a direct correlation yeah. to Games Workshop. Now, this is my jam because I read a lot of 2000 AD and I read a lot of Judge Dredd. Um, whereas I have not touched foundation for quite some time. <laughs> we, we started off with my strong suit and yeah. we're going to go into your strong suit. So, uh, to give you guys a little bit of background, 2000 AD is a weekly British serialized comic anthology, science fiction magazine first published in 1977. It's most noted for its Judge Dredd stories and has included the international talents of artists and writers like Alan Moore, Dave Gibson, Grant Morrison, Brian Bolald, Bol- Brian Boland, Mike McConnon, John Wagner, Alan Grant, and Garth Ennis. Several of those names should stand out yeah. to everybody. Other series included Rogue Trooper, Slain, Sordium Dog, ABC Warriors, Nemesis the Warlock, and Nicola Dante. Strontium Dog is after Strontium Strontium, the uh, Element. Strontium the Element, that makes sense. It's named 2000 AD since at the time, 
Uh, that was the future, and no one expected it to last that long, yeah. which I thought was great. Uh, and 2000 AD is still being published. It is owned by its third company, but it is still being published. So yeah, uh, Dread was born out of the idea of merging the general anti-establishment movement while staying close to the lines of being on the establishment side. To quote John Sanders, the IPC publisher, the formula was simple. Violence on the side of justice. Dread could be violent as hell and no one could say a thing, yeah. which I think is fucking great. So yeah, it, it hit us with, you know, before I, before I jump into a little bit of notes that I collated about Dread, Dread is, you know, 2000 AD and Dread are, are hit us. Let us, hit us with some stuff. Okay, so Citadel or Games Workshop, Citadel Miniatures, <laughs> um, yep. And Games Workshop, I think they produced the game, licensed Judge Dredd. Yes. And there was a Judge Dredd game. There are Judge Dredd miniatures. And guess what? They are 100% Arbites. Arbites. Yeah. Uh, basically, they took the little uh, judge symbol off and just ported them directly. Um, the helmets are the same, yeah. everything. So the Arbides, which is how I pronounce it, if you don't like that, I That's don't care. That's what I say too, Adaptus Arbides. Um, it translated directly over. And the Hive Cities are basically a direct port of Mega City 1. I mean, uh, yeah. Necromunda is Mega City 1. Yeah. Just, yeah. That's how I've always viewed it because the games were all, uh, the, the 2000 AD um magazines and especially the judge dread uh, comics they also had um a couple of other judge comics uh my favorite yeah, judge judge anderson Ju was came. judge anderson she was the psychic yep who, who you if you've seen the movie dread you'll know of and yeah. then eventually um a, a judah which i'll talk about in a minute what judas are but uh, a judah took over as dread he was given dread's badge yeah so, so. um yeah, Necromunda is very much the warring gangs in Necromunda are just like the warring gangs in Mega City One, and oh, yeah. the um, and the spires the um, are just the same as the hab blocks. So you, when you have the um, the hive cities are just hab blocks written large. What's a hab block? It's an arcology where everybody lives, works, lives on the dole. They're poor, they get handouts and all inside one building. And just Mega City One has lots of these one buildings. So Mega City One is basically the New York, Washington, Baltimore. Yeah, it's all it's corridor. All the it's basically North the East, East Coast. Coast. Yeah, Northeast. Yeah. Um, and there were some ten mega cities on Earth. There was the Soviet mega city, which sometimes they yeah. Yep. They cooperated with sometimes the Soviet Mega City launched nukes at Mega City One. Um, There's the Oz, the Australian yeah. one, and then outside of the Mega Cities were basically the Badlands, which you saw in the horrible Sylvester Stallone. Although in some ways, the sort of the campiness one goes better with the 2000 it, AD. It, it's such a cult classic now. Like I, I agree with you, it's super campy, but it's also like one of one of those like. If you were to ask me, hey, what's a good cult classic yeah. sci-fi? I'd be like, watch Judge Dredd. But you have the mutants living outside in the wastelands. And these oh, yeah. are irradiated and plague-infested mutants. And they just, like, actually, uh, if, that, if the Patreon, you get an, uh, a picture of the uh, 2000 AD cover that's up, uh, that's most probably a mutant. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> looks like an alien, but probably it's immune. probably yeah. immune. Um, so th that was sort of the world. It, it was sort of a wasteland outside of the megacities, which pretty well describes a lot of hive planets. Yeah, or or even uh, Terra pre yes. unification wars. Pre unification dread, and the whole two thousand AD was basically a um, a critique of what was going on in Britain in the seventies and into the yep. 80s. So you had labor strife. You had a lot of people out of work. They were living on the dull. They were living in their uh, in what's called council housing, which were these 
large housing developments are put together. You could think of public housing in the U.S. Um, they're infested with crime, people out of work. You had labor riots. And all of this is mirrored in the 2000 AD and especially the Judge Dredd comics. And then you had yeah. the judges going out to put down these labor riots. And and that's the interesting thing, you know, that, that quote by Sanders, mm -hmm. by John Sanders, that the formula was simple, violence on the side of justice. The whole reason that they did that was because they were being anti-establishment yes. by making this statement that the establishment is heavy handed, but the establishment was like, God damn right. We're heavy handed. Like the establishment didn't get it Yeah, and, and <laughs> right over their heads. <laughs> this is how you see again. Now, most people will, will cover um, Starship Trooper later on, but it has yep. the same sort of thing. So a lot of people, especially with the movie, because the movie doesn't, hit it as much because it's a visual medium and they took a lot of liberties with the actual story. But a lot of people read Starship Trooper. And when I first read it younger, I saw it as this militaristic, yeah, go get it. It was a great sort of patriotic book about fighting this, you know, evil horde of insects and, and the, um, the, the troopers were the good guys and all that. But in reality, it was written as an anti-war book in yeah. um, that was critiquing what was going on in the world at that time. Judge yeah, Dredd is the same ways, way. Yeah, a lot of ways the movie Starship Troopers is too. It is, um, but people don't recognize it's just, it. People don't recognize it. The other, the other movie that's like that. I and, and sorry, this is just this just popped into my mind um, because I read this statistic this week, which is which blew my fucking mind. Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket is also exceptionally anti-war. Oh yeah. However, Full Metal Jacket led to an almost thirty percent increase in military recruitment, and recruiters would show it to potential recruits in recruitment stations, and for whatever reason. Just that first 30 minutes of the movie would get people to sign up, which is which like, you know, Stanley must have been like, what is going on? <laughs> if <laughs> like, you had to associate one song with a war movie, what would it be? Fortunate Son. Yes, which is an anti-war <laughs> an anti anti-war song. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> but but it's also like like I, I even hear Fortunate Son play in my head when Kev brings out his Valkyries in a, in a Warhammer. Oh game. yeah, every time like, I see a helicopter. Ingrained. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right? And and it'll and for a lot of ways, the reason that the military guys do that, and they still do that, you know, military guys still have bands that they love playing over and over again. They're doing it because they're not they're they're not super happy anymore. You know, they're they're yeah. making they understand that some of it's part of it's just interesting how yeah. Anyway, we're we're getting off Yeah. But anyway, back yeah. <laughs> yeah, back to Judge Dredd. <laughs> um so one of the things that I found interesting doing all of this, that the name Dredd came from another proposed comic that was centered around a horror strip about a hanging judge named Judge Dredd who is actually named after a reggae and ska artist of the same name that was popular at the time. So while that horror comic, that horror like Western comic never came to fruition, the name stuck and that's how we got Judge Dredd, which I thought, which I thought was crazy. I'm like, wait, there was a dude and it's, it's not D R E D D it's D R E A D <laughs> was the, was the artist. But I was like, that's crazy. The look of Judge Dredd, uh, Spanish artist Carlos Esguerrero was brought in to do the original concepts. He did not stay on as the first artist that did Dredd, but he was brought on for the comic, uh, for the concept artist. And he was actually shown the Death Race 2000 film poster featuring Frankenstein clad in black leather armor. And that was like kind of the basis that he started with. And to that, he added armor panels, chains, spikes, red and gold accents. Um, and then that concept became what we know is the, the kind of black and red with gold accent armor that we know today. But it, it's interesting because death race 2000, mm -hmm. uh, an old film. And if you've seen the remake of death race, you know, uh, no, you got to watch the Statham you, plays uh, Frankenstein. Yeah. You got to watch but, the but, original. Yeah. Oh, you got, yeah, you got to watch the original. The, the the remake the remake did some fun stuff, but it's definitely not. Um, the remake an did not <laughs> have Sylvester Stallone. 
That's true. That's true. As uh, uh, now, the machine gun. I can't remember his name. Um, now, now I could go the off remake on that of whole thing. the remake of Dread. That the the movie yes. named Dread is amazing. It is, and I and I'm hoping they're doing more stuff. Fingers crossed. I don't think it did that well. But yeah, it was, uh, that was amazing. You had Judge Anderson, you had uh, much more of uh, Dread the way he should be with his auto gun and how that all worked. It really gave, uh, Sylvester Stallone's version did not give the idea that judges were these superhuman executioners. Yeah. Uh, You didn't, you know, the, you dispatch one judge to put down a riot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, you you had kind of mentioned a lot of this stuff, you know, the, the robot wars, which popularized Dread, which mm-hmm. talked a lot about the mega cities and stuff like that. It, you know, we, we hadn't we haven't mentioned yet the Department of Justice and why the Department of Justice is important. But the Debar- Department of Justice is something that uh, we'll get back to here in a second. And then in the 1986 series of Oz, where Dredd goes to Australia chasing a sky surfer, the Judah are introduced as being a genetic clone army. So before we get back to the Games Workshop early publications, which, which Chalk already dipped into, which goes into Citadel miniatures and some of the miniatures that they made, um, the concepts of arcologies, as you said, are that's a thing. Uh, in fact, uh, it, it's it's you you had mentioned um, government housing projects mm-hmm. being uh, it legitimately was an architectural movement in the fifties and sixties. It was popularized by a French architect. I cannot remember his name, but the whole idea that you live here and then you leave here to go work here and then you leave the work zone to go have your entertainment zone it actually created these weird like lawless wastelands because no one would be in the habitation zone um and then that would allow crime to happen when no one was there and then yeah. no one would be in the commercial zone and then that kind of got rolled into the idea of like a, what what is now kind of seen as like apartments the the idea of ecology kind of went away but there were these communities where everything you know you worked lived and shopped in that area um these are real ideas these are real things that were kind of addressed to deal with population and overpopulation actually um, i think it's cutter is building one right now oh yeah well and uh there there's a massive one in um just outside of san diego it's it, no no it's we're we're talking massive no 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 like what cutter is doing and... no no what cutter is doing is a single building that is oh over okay, so it's not like a bunch of complexes no just it's a single building a city, 100 in, in a miles long <sighs> oh yeah um the line the line Yes, yes. That is uh, what which, an arcology is. Yeah, yeah. It's you, you never have to leave the city for anything you want. Yeah. Th- th- this community that I'm talking about that's just out of San Diego, there's um, there's two bowling alleys, there's two movie theaters, there's like bodegas on every, every apartment block has a bodega mm-hmm. on the bottom floor, and then there's two grocery stores. But obviously people are still leaving, but you have to have a key to get in. Like you have to have a key to get into the gate. Yeah. But like, like literally if you work at the bodega and you live in the apartment complex, you never have to leave. And like that, that's, it's a really weird idea to us now. It's probably a way to, to deal with. The oh, there are a lot spread, of these but, sort of work live situations that are being built. Yeah. But w- while, the, the difference between what that is and then what was happening in England is the council housing was not like that. It was just a place of public housing where you'd warehouse the yeah. poor uh, who yeah. couldn't live anywhere else. And that's really, especially in the, you see that in the, the Dread movie where they're in Peachtree Plaza, which was not in the comic books, by the way. Um, yeah, Peach, Peach Trees was a made have block just for the movie. Yeah, just for the movie. There are stores on the bottom of, but they're all closed. And right. everything, everything is just, just, uh, uh, um, and it's such a state of disrepair. Yeah. And a lot of, uh, in a bunch of the Dread comics, they talk about going into hab blocks after uh, they, they talk about block, and they, they're block riots where two of these blocks fight each other. The block wars yeah. Oh, yeah. is a big, is it's, a big it's, deal. Um, it's and, the Necromunda, you know, com- yeah, confrontation, really which became Necromunda. Yeah. Um, the Justice Department, of course, is the Ministerium. Yeah, yeah. The uh, you know, I I would uh, I would say 
a little bit of mixture of the just justice department in our own dark history as a human species is the, is the inquisition. And then like you just said, the mm-hmm. adaptus arbides, um, are, are, and the arbides are judges like yeah. in a lot of ways, the arbides carry the judge, jury and executioner thing. And, and that's the, you know, when we, when we talk about our hive lore, often we talk about how, the Arbides or the Vizgalita are only kind of responding every once in a while. The administratum marshals are, are responding to other stuff. The police are the administratum marshals. The Arbides are the, you done fucked up, they go yeah. shoot you. <laughs> the Inquisition is the Arbides done fucked up, they're going to shoot you. Um, like there's there's a ratchet system up, you know, and, and, and realistically in a hive city and an underhive, the Inquisition mm-hmm. isn't going to show up until uh, the, no, the shit's the, hit the, the fan. The, yeah. um... The Arbides are would be the equivalent of the FBI or the National Police or whatever. Right. It's like exactly you can fuck around with your local sheriff or your local police department, but once the guys in suits show up, yeah, it, you know things yeah, so, get serious. So, somebody massively fucked up. Yeah. So the last ones out of the the stuff that we covered were the Judah, and the Judah in their storyline has connections to the Gene Tech Warriors of the Unification Wars, which obviously led to the Thunder Warriors, and even the Space Marines. So a Judah, which is part of a cloned army, it's a clone army made by a former Mega City One bioengineer who fled to Australia. Um, they're essentially. Like little clones, it, it's in play, and I I haven't read the series. Maybe Chuck, you can. No, you I can actually haven't read straighten this one us either. out. Okay, uh, but they're like little clones of Dread and other judges, basically. And eventually, a Judah replaces Dread when Dread retires. Um, so, so it's interesting. Actually, there is one of the Gene armies mm-hmm. in Forty K uses as a rank something like judah it is from the oh god what storyline is it from um i read it not too long ago it has who's the uh who's the immortal that works for the council that tried to like engineer the uh the the civil war the horse heresy um, um his, his name's like john grammaticon grammaticon it's it, he's in that storyline and they're fighting on some planet with warp sorcery against like lizard people. Lizard people with warp sorcery are fighting basically the Imperial Guard. And it, oh, it's in the Alpha Legion book. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And yes, <laughs> the, 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 there you go. The, the Geno 3 2 Chiliad, I think one of their um, ranks is like uh, Judah. Judah, I wouldn't be surprised, and and that's it, and that kind of gets us into chalk. You had really briefly talked about it because you had talked about the connection to to 2000 AD. There's a very big connection here, and that's because Games Workshop started their humble beginnings were in running gaming conventions and distributing Dungeons and Dragons mm-hmm. as the licensor and importer for TSR products to the UK. Yeah, you know, in 1979, they formed Citadel Miniatures. And through Citadel Miniatures, they started selling their metal miniatures for use in wargaming and role-playing games. And that's where you got the 2000 AD miniatures. That's where you got a lot of your starting miniatures. Uh, and interestingly enough, well, before before we get to this interesting tidbit, you know, nowadays we don't draw any difference between Citadel Miniatures and Games Workshop. But at a certain point, Citadel Miniatures was a subsidiary of Games Workshop. So it wasn't uncommon, and it's still not uncommon if you can find some of the older stocked boxes to find a box that has Citadel Miniatures on it. Uh, and these are those ads that, Chalk, you were talking about seeing yeah. in Dragon Magazine. Yeah. And the reason that it was in Dragon Magazine was because Games Workshop was TSR's distributor in the U.K., so the the back and forth essentially was, you know, you distribute our products, we make your miniatures, yada, yada, yada. In fact, to even tie this together more closely, Gary Gygax actually proposed the merging yeah. of Games Workshop and TSR. But Steve Jackson, not Steve Jackson of the American publishing game company, Steve Jackson Games, uh, just another guy named Steve Jackson. There are a lot of Steve and, Jacksons. Yeah. And Ian Livingston eventually backed out. Um, but, you know, 
Games Workshop published Call of Cthulhu, Rune Quest, Traveler, Middle Earth, Middle Earth role playing game. They started doing all of this stuff, and at a certain point, they stopped importing it. In uh, 1984, they stopped importing all of this stuff, and they they became a publishing house because it made it was less cost prohibitive yeah. for them to publish the books for the UK market in the UK than to import them across the ocean. It was around this time that uh, Ian Livingston and Steve Jackson sold their shares to Games Workshop and Games Workshop refocused on their own miniatures wargaming and fantasy battle game with Rogue Trader 40K yeah. coming out soon after. Um, but yeah, I, the you know all of this, that th- this is why... Judge Dredd uh, models are a thing. This is why our bodies are mm-hmm. a thing. It's why all of this is wrapped up together is because of, of this, this really unique history. And it's, it's, it's in, I mean, it, it's, it's beyond interesting. So, yeah, it's, the, the big switch came is they basically switched their strategy. So they started out, Games Workshops started out, yes, licensing games and yeah, producing and miniatures for those games. Supplements, yeah. But they found out that that limited them because most of their money was coming from the miniature line. They, they weren't getting much money from selling the licensed materials. And they realized that if they wanted to sell more miniatures, what they needed to do is generate a market for the miniatures. And how do you do that? You write your own games that require you to use miniatures. Right. Because all the miniatures they were selling were people buying them for D&D. Right. And, and, like so... I, and we didn't really use miniatures in D&D. People might right. have a miniature, and if you're lucky, yeah. the DM maybe had like a monster or something, but no, you did not have, and even on today's campaigns. I mean, watch, watch, if you really want an idea of what it was like playing D&D in the 80s, watch Stranger Things. Yes. The, the DM, the DM has a demigorgon. Yeah. There was still an entire adventure where he had nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how I played. Yeah. I, we had, we each had like our own miniatures. They weren't painted because we didn't know how to paint stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just, in the, se- I still in the have 70s. Painted D&D I'm, miniatures. I'm talking the 70s too. I'm not talking the 80s. You know, I'm talking. Oh, with, do I? I have 80s unpainted. Yeah. I probably have 70s unpainted DD. Yeah, I started, yeah. you, you got to realize in the 80s, I was in high school. I started playing DD in like fourth or fifth grade. So right, I'm right. talking 76, I would have been 10. Yeah. Um, and yeah, maybe you had miniature, but you didn't do anything with them. You put them in front of your, like, in front of you on the table and said, that's me. Yeah. You didn't yeah, you walk may, them around a map. It. Yeah. We didn't. It, it was all pencil and paper. Yeah. Lot, lots of, here's the dot that's me, here's the X that's you. Yeah, a lot of that. And um, and, and, I, and that's that's how... That's how my gaming experience was largely through the the 2000s. You know, it, after after the end of the end wow, during the end times, I at the Warhammer Fantasy Battle event the end times, I had started to kind of collect Warhammer Fantasy Battle armies and that's when I started to use miniatures in D&D, the D&D games that I was running. But that like let me be clear, I was buying Citadel miniatures to use yeah. in my D&D game. I wasn't buying Watsky's, you know, Wizards of the Coasts or Reaper miniatures. I was still buying Citadel miniatures. So that's the impact that they had. And that's because they had the rights to produce miniatures for role-playing supplements and games, you know, in all of these different properties that they had in 2000 AD. And, and, that's why <laughs> Rogue Trooper and Judge Dread models ended up in Rogue Trader. That's why Rogue Trader is not it has the forty thousand subtitle because it can, God forbid you confuse it with the Rogue Trooper mm-hmm. model that's in the Citadel line. But the other really interesting thing is in the eighties they had and they have maintained until this day the only rights to produce 28 millimeter miniatures for the middle earth role-playing system. They own the rights to produce miniatures for Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. And they are the only ones. If you, if you want, if you don't want to play 
an elf miniature, but you want to play, I don't remember the elves. If you want to play Frodo. Yeah, you, the, the half, the half, you half. have to use. Yeah. yeah, you have to buy it from uh, Citadel. That's the only place you're going to get it. Um, and and that, you know, Lord of the Rings, the, the Lord of the Rings miniatures game is seen today as one of the reasons that they weathered the collapse of Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Yeah. And, and transitioned into Age of Sigmar. I, I do want to correct one thing. Uh, you keep on saying yeah. that it's Rogue Trooper with the 40K, subtitle 40K. It's actually the other way around because, remember... Rogue, Rogue yeah, Rogue Trooper was a comic No, no, Rogue Trader. So AD. the game is... So you had two games when Rogue Trader came out. You had Warhammer Fantasy and the way to, that Citadel differentiated their science fiction is they had Warhammer Fantasy, so Warhammer, oh. Fantasy, and Warhammer 40,000, which was science fiction because it was 40,000 years in the future, future stuff, fantasy stuff. Right. And then it was subtitled Rogue Trader. Yeah, so so sorry, um, I, I, I guess I misspoke. There was a role-playing supplement for the 2008 That's Rogue Trooper. Comic. Rogue Trooper, and that's one of the reasons why they didn't call the book Rogue Trader. Yes, no, well, I'm saying they specifically, we, we did, tend to call yeah. the the first edition yeah. of 40k Rogue Trader, but in reality, it is it's 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 for it's Warhammer 40, 40k Rogue Trader. Yeah, yeah. and the forty thousand is to differentiate it from Warhammer Fantasy. So you you basically had two lines of Warhammer at the beginning. You had Warhammer yeah. Fantasy. Warhammer science fiction and the science fiction was the 40,000 and I, they, I, I can't, I can't find the book cover, but yeah, yeah, you, you, you are correct. I keep doing rogue trader Warhammer because that's the way we, that's think the way we now. think about it to but differentiate it, was, it. It was Warhammer 40,000 rogue trader. And I, I say they, that because yeah. of the similarity between the two game systems at the beginning and how they, Oh yeah. How Citadel games workshop and Citadel, Flat out said, and you can read this, you can go back and read this in some of the interviews, we needed to make more miniatures, so we decided to make a science fiction game based on the fantasy game. And so, Because their fantasy game was doing really yeah, well but at the they time. wanted to sell more stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, <laughs> they, and this is where that entire line of we're not a games company, we're a miniatures yeah. company comes from. And that's what they said. Uh, They've sort of switched that around, but... For the longest time... They, they waffle on that yeah, one a bit. <laughs> still, the majority of their um, income comes from miniatures. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, hands down. They, they, no one... I, I, so at the very, very, very beginning of Games Workshop's career, there, you know, we, we never talked about the like four guys that founded it. But out of the four guys that founded it, one of the guys actually left because the original idea was that they were going to make video games. And that guy didn't want to make video games. He wanted to be involved with board games. And if I am not mistaken, he is one of the reasons that later on a lot of the like Hero Quest and War Masters and kind mm -hmm. of the the Citadel miniatures crossovers into popular board games happened. Um, and and we'll I, we'll dive a little bit more. That that's something to dive into as we keep going with the series. We'll talk about the guys that originally founded it. But yeah, it was. Um, the reason that I got that switched in my head is uh, not Rick Priestley, but um, Livingston. Ian Livingston had said in an interview in 1989 when somebody had asked, why is it Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader? Is they had wanted to yeah. call the book just, just Rogue Trader, but somebody had said, well, isn't that just like Rogue Trooper, Trooper yeah. the supplements that we make? And that's why they made the change. So in my brain, I have the title they wanted. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you are correct. It, it, the, the book is Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader. So sorry, sorry, but thank you for, for catching. Cause well, I, I think it's, a, it's, it's important in the evolution of uh, 40K as a, a game system is that its roots really lie in fantasy. Now, yeah. it, oh, it has devolved since then. You can no longer play, you know, there's no longer any sort of crossover. But at the beginning, it, it was fantasy battle. It, it was Warhammer Fantasy in space. Yeah. Well, and, and a lot of the reason 
that that happened was that, you know, looking into the context of the time, hindsight being 2020, we have a tendency to look at the, the release of Weta Workshop and Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings movies as being like this massive renaissance for like fantasy. But that's not necessarily true. The 70s into the 80s was a massive renaissance for fantasy because that's when a lot of you know, the ideas of Renaissance fairs, obviously they predate that, but a lot of the ideas of the popularization of Renaissance fairs, TSR, mm -hmm. Dungeons and Dragons, that was its heyday. So when Games Workshop released Warhammer Fantasy Battle in 1979-ish, um, it was massively popular and Warhammer Fantasy Battle was the flagship game forever and, and even and even then it was warhammer fantasy roleplay <laughs> like the original edition was a role-playing game it was not a, a a miniatures war game um and what happened was in the 2000s when the end times happened when warhammer fantasy battle became age of sigmar Warhammer Fantasy Battle had been declining in popularity for the majority of the 90s, and Warhammer 40K had been exploding, mm -hmm. and that was because yeah. there was a huge uptick and resurgence in science fiction. And now we've got this interesting renaissance because everything in this nerdo geekosphere is really, really popular. You know, people love science fiction, people love fantasy, people love horror, people... Everyone is kind of embracing this idea of, like media and what media can do and what stories mm -hmm. can do so everything's popular yeah, yeah. i was looking back at anyway. some of the, the <laughs> earliest boxes of the warhammer fantasy battle and warhammer fantasy and you notice that the two ones it's exactly the same you have warhammer is the main title on both and then they're subtitled oh, yeah. like this one you know forty thousand is just tacked on there and then on the other ones you've got like fantasy battle is like written underneath or whatever yeah exactly <laughs> and it was the same font for the longest time and now we have two different yeah. fonts um yeah it, it's 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 pretty crazy uh it it's very interesting how how all of this evolved and how it's continuing to evolve yeah that brings us to a great yeah a, a place i feel for our first episode that'll wrap it up for our first episode on the origins of 40k this is pretty much an endless topic to unpack and chalk and i will endeavor to explore as much of it as we possibly can since this is a special series we'll probably look at releasing part two in about a month's time chalk and i will do the research that we need to do touch base and kind of come up with a game plan mm -hmm. to record um, but we have many, many, many more science fiction settings to pull apart, including Starship Troopers as the novel, Dune, and that's only to name a couple that come to mind. Not to mention, we're going to bring in the rest of the cast to do some roundtables. So expect to get some hot takes and questions from Marky, from Tom, from Kev, from Emmy, from Rugen, from... Um, Chuckerfly, you know, I'm sure some of our frequent guests, I already named off Emmy, some of our frequent guests like Emmy and Ickbard will probably uh, drop on by to ask us those hard hitting hot take questions. No, um, and if I can really plus, uh, uh, twist your arm, <laughs> at some point we're going to do, uh, I, I want to do uh, a, a look at um, Epic. Oh, 100%. 100%. Th through all of this, you know, we'll talk about we'll talk about confrontation, we'll talk about epic, we'll get into all of the the lost games. Maybe that's, you know, as as we as we cycle through Origins of 40K, maybe we'll go into lost games of Games Workshop. That'd be kind of fun. Maybe not lost. There there's a there's that perennial uh uh there's rumor. Somebody, there's always some that uh, oh. they'll they'll be adding um they're going to be adding tanks and uh Horus Heresy uh, Space Marines to uh, Adeptus Titanicus. Titanicus? Mm, supposedly, cool. I, supposedly this summer after 10th edition comes out. We'll see. You know, the old world's coming back too, so I'm, I'm interested to get my old world yeah. gaming on again. Not to mention, um, you know, as far as like fan communities go, the Mordenheim fan community yeah. is huge. I tried to sneak Mordenheim into this episode and it just didn't fit. So <laughs> I don't know much about Mordenheim. I know the storyline. I don't know the, the game. Yeah. But, you know, talk about the old world coming back. I've got up there someplace... I've got a, ba a box of Bretonians and Lizardmen. Um, oh, Warhammer. oh, that's right. Yeah, it's that's like, right. I don't know what um, 
edition it is. I'm thinking maybe it's fourth edition. Yeah, you'll you'll have to show that box off next time, and maybe in a Patreon yeah. segment we can talk about it. So, is there something we left out of this this first one? I think for for me, I think there was a um, we covered what was going on really well. Uh, you got two of the influences. Of course, the the ones that most people will think of are, are coming up in the, the upcoming. Um, oh yeah, you know, Dune, Starship Troopers. Aliens, although that's late, that's not the foundation <laughs> of forty uh, k. Oh no, a- yeah. Alien came Alien out, came out in eighty four. Alien was released in nineteen seventy nine. Aliens, Whoa. was nineteen, yeah, eighty four. Eighty four. So, so eight, that, I take that back. They both predate a little bit, and, and de- yeah. definitely, it is very difficult to talk about Gene Steelers or Tyranids without talking about aliens. Yeah, and um, my favorite when we are. Um, also, that ties in with that, um, I think, is H.P. Lovecraft. I think oh, it yeah. ties in with the Tyranids much more than it does with people always think Lovecraft and chaos. And I don't think Lovecraft goes with chaos. I think Lovecraft goes with the Tyranids. Priestley lists Lovecraft as influencing the development of the chaos gods. But yeah, I, I the Tyranids are definitely are definitely a cosmic out there horror. The, the, the chaos gods seem too intimately connected with what's going on in the materia. Oh, yeah, they care way, care way too as, much. As, as um, <laughs> the gods that Lovecraft had that were basically indifferent. I mean, the Lovecraft's gods see us the same way as you see an ant. Exactly. You might not want to step on an ant, but you don't really care. Yeah. That's the Tyranids. Yeah, 100%. All right, guys, if you have any questions for either Chalk or myself or Lore that you want to share with the show or your short stories or maybe even some spooky stories, you can reach us by email at underthehiveofmadness at gmail.com or jimdarkgaming at gmail.com. Chalk, why don't you let everybody know how they can find you? Well, I'm going to a couple ways. Um, if you do want to email me, I'm going to let uh, Ryan put uh, my email chalkbalom at gmail.com in the show notes. Perfect. I can do that. You can, you can also find me on the clock app, TikTok under Chalk Balam. And um, I'm on the Discord server as Chalk. And uh, I need to start using Instagram more, but I'm on there as Chalk Balam underscore. And we'll put all that up on the uh, show notes. Yeah, I, yeah, I always try to drop all those spellings. You can also, as, as Chuck mentioned, we do have a Discord community. Go ahead and head over there. We chat about Warhammer 40k lore, the hobby and tactics, plus we talk about Age of Sigmar, Warhammer Fantasy Battle, creative writing, video games, role playing, and so much more. If you want to find out more about the show, you can find us on Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram, or go to our website, which is www.underthehiveofmadness.com. You can help the podcast grow by liking and reviewing us wherever you get your podcast fix. Our home is Spotify and Anchor FM, but you can also find us on Google, Stitcher, Audible, and many, many more. If you'd like to support us, head on over to Patreon. That's www.patreon.com slash under the hive of madness. All Patreon members get access to a video podcast with minimal editing so you can see our beautiful faces and hear all of our amazing blunders. Plus, we've got a little bit of other video content to go along with it. All Patreon levels also get access to our quarterly painting contest. Plus, we've got some other perks at higher levels. I think it's worth it. You should probably go check it out. Well, Chuck, this would normally be where I plugged one of the fine establishments of the Underhive. You know, whoever is hosting us here at 665.66 UHMR Camera at Radio. But without anything to plug, I'm just going to say at least you led me to this giant cavern full of Archaeotech. And this time I get to sell all of it and not share any with any of the boys. Well, you know, next time we've got to... Uh meet at uh the old rump and pump up on <laughs> sub level three i understand they've got a great show and great ribs <laughs> there, you, there you go like you know i'll have to hit them up and see if we can get a sponsored <laughs> spot in their back room <laughs> can't stop this signal no matter how far underground we put ourselves as the sump and the frost hollow are always bouncing your light of truthiness and the true discord of rebellion. We are 665.66 UHMR Chemrat Radio. Reminding all of you Chemrats, Hive Mice, and Sump Ghoulies to keep those dials fixed right here. 
Same ratty frequency for a dose of the same ratty ass attitude. Always remember, when the ball is in the four-armed emperor's court, he might be ready to spill your beans. And by beans, I mean guts. (laughs) (laughs) Did I get you? (laughs) Yeah, you got me.